I'm delighted to be here today. Um, on, on May 30th this year, uh, I was in Madrid, Spain. I had been invited by the um, chief anti-corruption uh, prosecutor of Spain to come and give evidence on um, uh, Russian money laundering in Spain. And my meeting was at 11 a.m. in the morning. At 9.30 a.m. that day, um, two Spanish police officers came to my hotel room uh, from a different division with an arrest warrant from Russia, um, on an Interpol arrest warrant for Russia. Um, and they said, you're under arrest. I was, I was lucky enough to have enough time to uh, tweet out that I was being arrested and all hell broke loose around the internet and around the world. And um, uh, two hours later, I was released from Spanish custody. So when I say that I'm delighted to be here, I genuinely am delighted to be here. <laughs> so wh why, why are the Russians so mad at me? And why is Vladimir Putin so mad at me? Um, and I, uh, some of you probably know my story. A lot of you don't. And so I want to tell you in brief um, what happened. Um, at one point, I was the largest foreign investor in Russia. I had an investment fund called the Hermitage Fund, which had $4.5 billion invested in the Russian stock market. And when I was running this investment fund, I discovered um, that there was massive stealing going on in the, in, the sh in the companies that I owned shares of. And so I decided to do something um, which was to research how they did the stealing and then share that research um, with the international media. And um, for a while, it had a, had a positive effect. Um, uh, and normally, when, when you... Um, when you expose corruption, the share prices go down. But the share prices were so low in Russia um, that by exposing corruption, it increased the probability that maybe some of the stealing would stop and the share prices would actually go up. And so for, for a period of time, um, it all worked, worked out pretty well. And, and strangely, um, it worked out well um, because at the time that I was first starting to um, go after these um, uh, corrupt oligarchs was the time that Vladimir Putin had just come to power. And Vladimir Putin um, was fighting with the same guys I was fighting with at the time. And so um, there's this expression, your enemy's enemy is your friend. And so a brief, for a brief period of time as I was going after these guys, Putin was, was cleaning up and, and sort of going after them with me. And, I, and I've never met Vladimir Putin or ever spoke to him before or since, um, but we had this alignment of interests. And it worked out pretty well until one day he decided to win his war with the oligarchs. In late 2003, Vladimir Putin arrested the richest oligarch in Russia, a man named Michael Hordakovsky, who was the owner of an oil company called Yukos. He arrested him, he put him on trial, and he allowed the television cameras to come into the courtroom and to film the richest man in Russia on trial sitting in a cage. And imagine you're the 17th richest man in Russia and you watch the richest man, far smarter, far better, far more powerful than you sitting in a cage. What's your natural reaction going to be? You don't want to sit in that cage yourself. And so one by one by one, the oligarchs went to Vladimir Putin in the following summer after Hordakovsky had been sentenced to 10 years in prison. And they said to him, Vladimir, what do we have to do to make sure we don't sit in a cage? And he said, it's real simple, 50%. Not 50% for the Russian government or 50% for the presidential administration of Russia, but 50% for Vladimir Putin. And at that moment in time, Putin became the richest man in the world. I estimate his net worth to be $200 billion. And at that point in time, all of my naming and shaming campaigns were no longer um, seeming so good to him. And so after that, um, I was expelled from Russia. I was declared a threat to national security. My offices were raided by the police. They seized all of our documents. And they used those documents um, to commit a $230 million tax rebate fraud. They didn't steal $230 million from me. They stole $230 million of taxes that I paid to the Russian government. I hired a young lawyer um, named Sergei Magnitsky to investigate what they had done and to expose it. And Sergei was the one who figured out this tax rebate fraud. And he gave sworn testimony against the police officers who, see, who seized the documents that were used in the fraud. Um, 
instead of going after the police officers who, conduct, who, who did the fraud, um, they came after us. And five weeks after Sergei testified um, on the 24th of November 2008, they arrested Sergei Magnitsky. They put him in pretrial detention. He was then tortured in pretrial detention to get him to withdraw his testimony. They put him in cells with 14 inmates and eight, eight beds, left the lights on 24 hours a day to impose sleep deprivation. They put him in cells with no heat and no window panes in December in Moscow, so he nearly froze to death. They put him in cells uh, with no toilet, just a hole in the floor where the sewage would bubble up. And the purpose of this torture was to get him to withdraw his testimony against the corrupt police officers and to sign a false confession to say that he stole the $230 million and did so on my instruction. For Sergei, the idea of perjuring himself and bearing false witness was more painful than the, um, than the physical pain that they were pressuring him with, and he refused. And the pressure got more and more and more and his health started to break down. He ended up losing 20 kilos, de developing terrible pains in his stomach, and being diagnosed as having pancreatitis and gallstones. And he was supposed to have an operation, which was scheduled for the 1st of August, 2009. Um, but a week before the operation, they came to him again, again asked him to sign this false confession. Again, he refused. And they abruptly moved him um, from the prison that had a medical facility to a maximum security prison called Butyrka with no medical wing at all. And at Butyrka, his health completely broke down. He went into a constant downward spiral, um, and they refused him all medical attention. He and his lawyers wrote 20 different desperate requests for medical attention. All of them were either ignored or refused in writing. And on the night of November 16, 2009, Sergei Magnitsky went into critical condition. On that night, um, the Butyrka authorities didn't want to have responsibility for him anymore, so they put him into an ambulance, sent him to a different prison. When he arrived at the different prison, instead of putting him in the emergency room, they put him in an isolation cell, they chained him to a bed, and eight riot guards with rubber batons beat Sergei Magnitsky to death. He was 37 years old. He left a wife and two children. That was nine years ago. And since then, um, I've put aside all of my work as a businessman and as a financier to go after the people who killed Sergei Magnitsky to get justice for him. And at first, we tried getting justice inside Russia. Um, Sergei Magnitsky had written everything down in the form of 450 criminal complaints that he had filed during his 358 days in detention. And it's the most granular, well-documented human rights abuse case that's come out of Russia in the last 35 years. But that had no impact. Putin personally got involved in circling the wagons Putin personally exonerated every single person who played a role in this crime. He gave promotions and state honors to some of the people most complicit. And in the most shocking miscarriage of justice, three years after they killed Sergei Magnitsky, they put him on trial in the first trial against a dead man in the history of Russia. They put me on trial as his co-defendant. We were both found guilty. They couldn't do anything more to Sergei than they had already done. They sentenced me to nine years in absentia. So it became obvious that we needed to get justice outside of Russia. But what I discovered is at that time, there were no mechanisms to get justice outside of a country that commits its atrocities and has corruption in their own system. And so I said to myself, if there is no mechanism to get justice, then we need to create one. And so I said, well, what mechanism can we create to make justice for Sergei Magnitsky? And I looked at the situation, and I said, Sergei Magnitsky was killed because they uncovered a $230 million tax rebate fraud. And the people who stole that money don't keep that money in Russia. They keep that money in the West. You can see those people walking around Belgravia. You can see those people walking on the Champs-Élysées and down Fifth Avenue. These Russians like to keep their money um, where it's safe. They like to go shopping. They like to travel. They like to live the life of unbelievable luxury. And so I said to myself, um, if this is what they want, then this is what we should take away from them. And I, I took this idea to Washington, to a Democratic senator named Benjamin Cardin of Maryland and a Republican senator, John McCain, who's passed away. And I said, can we um, freeze the assets and ban the visas of the people who killed Sergei Magnitsky? And they heard this story, the same story I've just shared with you, and they said, yes. 
and that became known as the Magnitsky Act. They introduced it um, into the Senate in October of 2010, and roughly at the same time in the House of Representatives. And while most things in Washington are very fractious and partisan, the one thing that seemed to everybody could, could agree on is that Russian torturers and murderers um, shouldn't be allowed to come to the United States and spend their money in the United States. And when it, when it went for a vote in the Senate, it passed 92 to 4 in November of 2012. It passed 89% of the House of Representatives in the same month. And on December 14th, 2012, President Obama signed the Magnitsky Act into law. And Vladimir Putin went out of his mind when this happened. He got so angry. He, in retaliation, he banned the adoption of Russian orphans by American families. And these were not, the, Russia didn't put up the healthy orphans for adoption, just the sick ones. These were orphans with HIV and Down syndrome and various other ailments, which generally, who generally didn't survive in an orphanage in Russia, and they would be adopted by American families. And so effectively, Vladimir Putin was sentencing his orphans to death in retaliation for the Magnitsky Act. And so <clears throat> he not only did that, he then declared repealing the Magnitsky Act his single largest foreign policy priority. And some of you may remember that there was a famous Russian lawyer, a female Russian lawyer that went to Trump Tower in June of 2016 to meet with Donald Trump Jr., Jared Kushner, and Paul Manafort. Um, the meeting was specifically to talk about repealing the Magnitsky Act, and only to talk about repealing the Magnitsky Act. It's such a high, pro high priority item for Vladimir Putin. Well, um, thankfully, um, neither that meeting or various other things and many other things that the Russians have done um, have worked. And in fact, the Magnitsky Act hasn't been repealed. It's been globalized in the United States. In 2016, um, they, they, the same senators who, who passed the Russian Magnitsky Act created the global Magnitsky Act. They said, why should, um, why should a Saudi or a Chinese or a Venezuelan human rights um, violator um, uh, get a, a better deal, or I mean, sorry, a worse deal, uh, I mean, sorry, a better deal than a Russian human rights violator. Um, and so the, the Global Magnitsky Act passed unanimously in, in December of 2016. On the same day, the Estonian government passed their Magnitsky Act. Um, following that, we have a Canadian Magnitsky Act, a Lithuanian Magnitsky Act, a Latvian Ma Magnitsky Act, and a British Magnitsky Act. Um, that are all now on the books. Um, <clears throat> I am going uh, shortly uh, to Brussels next week to work on an EU Magnitsky Act, which looks like it's in the works. And it doesn't only just work for um, Putin and for Russian bad guys. Um, many of you will have been uh, shocked and appalled by the horrific murder of Jamal Khashoggi um, by Saudi agents in the um, uh, consulate in, in Istanbul. Well, now that is a perfect example of how the Magnitsky Act can be used um, against his killers from Saudi Arabia, and it's been proposed by the Senate Foreign Relations Committee to be the policy to be used in that case. Um, effectively, we, we have come up with a tool that can be used against impunity and, and um, human rights violations by any country in the world. And, um, and it's now a, a tool that I would say is going viral among human rights activists. I'll never be able to um, get over the burden of guilt that Sergei Magnitsky was killed because he was my employee, but I have been able to create a legacy for Sergei Magnitsky, uh, which will hopefully um, create consequences for bad guys all over the world and save lives as a consequence. Thank you very much.